All right. So, hello everyone. Once again, uh, thank you for joining. My name is Shane Sinha. I'm the community manager with Quick Start, and I will be hosting the uh, webinar for you. And uh, with us, we have Mr. Richard Rushing. He is the Chief Information Security Officer with uh, Motorola Mobility, and uh, he will be presenting the webinar for us today. And uh, over to you, Richard. As part of this webinar, uh, we'll talk really about a lot of the problems that are inside of uh, the world of IoT, uh, where to start and focus around uh, those issues, especially at the enterprise level, uh, as well as focusing in on some of the issues on IoT devices uh, as part of the same uh, functionality that's there. Uh, and looking at solutions uh, internally, which in a lot of cases is not buying a new product, it's more around the world of understanding the risks that are associated with the IoT and the classification of devices and making smart decisions based on, uh, on that. A, a little about me, uh, as you know, I'm CISO for Motorola Mobility. I've been CISO now for almost 14 years. Um, I've dealt with um, lots of activity from both uh, being a startup veteran to a large corporate initiative. I've done many articles for publications uh, around the world dealing with hacking and pen testing as well as um, early on in the early 2000s uh, we talked a, a lot about wireless or kind of the world before IoT where you had point of sale devices and wireless networks put into stores that were as a default configuration just because that was the way uh, they, they try to manage it. And it's the same problem that we see today with a lot of IoT uh, in general uh, on that side of it. So what is IoT and what's the, the functioning around it is basically it, it's what we refer to as a device that basically connects to the internet to send or receive data. Um, and if you looked at what IoT was defined at three years ago, the, the name has changed dramatically and the results have changed. So again, uh, those devices, you can have smart TVs, smart watches, uh, Fitbit, baby monitors, temperature stats, lighting arresters, uh, thermometers, air quality sensors, that list goes on and on and on. The big issue is that those devices typically form the function that they kind of enhance the way we either work or the way we live, providing us convenience, efficiency, control. Uh, again, if I can just wave a magic wand in front of a sensor and it opens a gate or does something else, it has to connect, it has to do something uh, that, that's around that. If I can talk to my device, it understands not only my communication, but communicates back without necessarily being connected to a wire or anything else over networks. The same with your smart TVs that can integrate other capabilities and functionality. Now, a lot of stuff comes into the play is that this year we'll have over 50 billion IoT devices on the internet. That's huge amounts of, of, of data that's actually there. And it's grown pretty much kind of from the early 80s where the explosion has taken place. But in the last three years, you've seen uh, these dramatically increase, both from a consumer side of it, so what you would go out and purchase, but also coming from the exact opposite side of that, of the technology side, where these have been deployed uh, with uh, businesses uh, for efficiency cost, for uh, OT or uh, factory functionalities. Um, all of that has been integrated and in moving just as rapidly into these networks uh, that's there. So IoT is not a simple technology at all, 
or a singular technology. It's complex. It's relatively what I refer to as an ecosystem. Um, and they can run industry specific applications. And uh, they love to have now established smart as kind of the cyber for IoT in front of different terms. But these are a bunch of different categories that people were dealing with around IoT and what each of the sensors were from kind of the world of being, hey, I'm looking at environmental characteristics, pollution, uh, weather, to smart cities where I'm dealing with traffic mo monitoring, lighting, law enforcement, uh, smart metering with pickup uh, for water, gas, et cetera, smart buildings and homes where the lights are active, AC controls, et cetera. Uh, on that to, with transportation, to energy, uh, and to industries in general, uh, leveraging these technologies to make better product, make the products cheaper, make them faster, providing additional functionality uh, that's there to where you're getting of knowing where people are. Uh, so I can provide services for them and things around that to uh, what, what you basically call smart living, where um, just-in-time information uh, connecting anywhere, anytime, provides you a wealth of data uh, that's in there. So that ecosystem basically is supporting what we're trying to do um, in, in many cases. Now, one of the key areas as you get into IoT is IoT is not is a lot of different problems wrapped up into one, but one that often gets overlooked is the data volumes per day. Uh, this is from Gartner, um, and just the number of uh, volumes that basically are enabled by IoT um, and the number of devices, you can see that in a lot of cases, whether it's wearables, connected car, or commercial aircraft, IOTs are actually providing better than 30% of all the data that's included in that. So all the data, 30% of that is coming from these IOT devices. And then it gets into this huge amount of pieces, whether it's, hey, uh, wearables are generating one megabyte per day, but if you multiply that times how many wearables are actually out there, you actually get into the terabytes of data. And where does that data sit? How long, how is it there? There's a whole privacy perspective on it, but the data is, is a large thing. This is why you see more and more that whether it's Azure, AWS, uh, any of the cloud providers are having IoT solutions in the cloud because connectivity is ubiquitous and the data storage capability requires that, that I can scale this. So if I have 100 devices one minute and 10,000 devices the next minute, I can scale accordingly to that. But as you can see, huge amounts of data are actually being uh, collected over different functionalities that are actually there. So there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of problems and there's a lot of problems that are hyped in IoT as well. Uh, and so you run into a couple of things. So a lot of the IoT world and early adoption of the effort was that you were taking typically devices that weren't connected to a network and you were attaching a network to it to do the connection. So these devices didn't know how to talk uh, via their serial interface, didn't know how to do anything except someone found a bolt on and plugged it in. That was, that was one of the key areas and yeah, that doesn't always end well as things are not really designed to be on the network or suddenly on the network, bad things can happen to them uh, around that area. The same goes for low power. And what I mean by low power is these devices are not heavy and CPUs uh, and everything else because they're always constrained by power. Um, laptops, desktops, other computer systems, I can plug into 120 volts or 220 volts and, and, and some amperage and I can get plenty of power to those devices to support the CPUs, the screens, et cetera, with that. IoT devices are very much different. They're usually situated on 
um, DC power uh, because it's ran into beside the building, it's easy to deploy, and it's not a lot of voltage. And so in doing so, you run into these things are not really huge CPUs and everything else. So they're basically designed to be low powered sensors. Cost is key. So how can I make it cheaper? Having a slower CPU because it's not doing a lot uh, is, is easy on that. Um, a lot of the application software is what we refer to as a supply chain. It's pretty much basic functionality. It didn't start li life as being what I wanted to create. It's the data centric portion of this that is actually there. One of the other sides of the issue that we always ran into and you still run into today is the updating of the software, whether it be the firmware or the application itself, not always easy to update. Uh, and that has to go back to the original, hey, these are low power, the memory's not there, cost effective. A lot of the update used to be, hey, replace this piece of hardware and you're now on version two. Um, that's fine if I can get to the piece of hardware. In some of the cases, a lot of IoT devices were put in locations where they're not easily to get to, uh, like on top of a street light or a telephone pole or a power pole. Uh, and so a lot of times the idea of just swapping out the device is a lot of extra dollars, typically to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a crew to go swap out pieces of the puzzle and that's that. Um, management of the devices were often overlooked. It was kind of fire and forget, turn it on and it reports no configuration necessary or once it's configured, it stays smart and will always just report back. So the management was always overlooked. Network communications, again, back to the low CPU. It's hard to encrypt data when I don't have a lot of CPU cycle that's actually there. So the network communications a lot of times were clear, uh, not encrypted, not secured. Same goes for, well, the data doesn't matter. It's just air quality sensors. It's just the temperature. It's just whether or not the lighting is up or on or off. Sometimes that's important. Sometimes it's not really that important. It's not, in, but as best practices, it should always be encrypted, but that would eat, the battery, lower the performance of the tool. So a lot of times they are backing off of that. So that was one of the things. And then a lot of times you did legacy protocol encapsulation, they kind of made it work. And, and sometimes that doesn't always bode well for these devices that are communicating that's there. You have different variants. I, I give it the 1.0, the 2.0, hey, the 1.0, I just sent data. The 2.0, now I start receiving data, and that changes the paradigm completely. When I'm sending out data, the, the security implications are relatively low for a lot of different things, depending on the device classification. We'll get into that a little bit later. But in the 2.0, when I'm starting to receive data and make decisions, that could be a problematic. So the temperature sensor turns into an air conditioning control sensor. Uh, so it's, hey, I'm just reporting temperature. Oh, now I determine when and the air conditioner turns on. Could be detrimental in some of those cases that are actually there. So if you look at IoT and enterprise, everyone has it and you're at risk. We don't, don't, uh, we don't have no IoT. It's the same as not having cloud computing, not having uh, malware in your network. It, it exists in today's age uh, that's there. Um, so take it from a serious standpoint and kind of your first step around some of this is to create policies of basically understanding that you're gonna have IoT. And you can create one that says, no, we're not gonna have IoT and have exceptions to that policy because they will happen. Um, if you're targeting your organizations, probably the first places to start are your real estate group or the people that manage your building. They probably have more IoT devices in your building than anybody else uh, that's doing anything uh, that's there. Uh, talk to the security group. Uh, their cameras are usually IoT devices. Uh, 
door alarms, uh, break glass alarms, things like that, or IoT devices, you probably want to talk to them the second step. And then you get into the next one, which is sometimes uh, IT. It could also be the business unit that's doing things, shipping and receiving, another good area. All those players have these devices internal. Now, how are they situated on your network? Are they plugged in or not plugged in? The little kiosk that uh, provides snacks or anything else or water, maybe on your network, may not be on your network. Those are all pieces in pro of the process. So one of the big areas is, uh, it talks about discovering what you have and discovering what you know. Well. There's a lot to look at uh, in that. So the most, one of the common ways that people do it is basically a network inventory of all devices that are on your network by MAC address. And the MAC address is a unique identifier that every piece of hardware has that connects to your network. And it's unique so that you should never have more than one MAC address on the, the, that in the organization. If you do, you're gonna have really bad networking issues. But for the most part, they're unique and you typically you will never see another MAC address that's there. So from that list with a little bit of Excel, you can do things uh, like a mashup with the OUI, which is basically an organizational unique identifier. So every manufacturer is assigned the prefix of the MAC address. So the first three character sets, uh, or first three octets in the MAC address tell me who the manufacturer is. So I could actually look that up and go, this is Cisco, this is Juniper, this is Palo Alto, this is Motorola, this is Lenovo, this is all these other businesses and related that are making devices that unique identifier tells you what it is. Now it doesn't tell you it tells you the manufacturer, doesn't tell you what the equipment is, but in some of the cases, you can really much rule out a lot of the things that you know. Is oh, these are, my, these are my switches, these are my routers, these are my hubs, these are my PCs, these are my uh, phones, et cetera, with that. And now you're left with a group that you can actually get about 90% there. And now you know, IP address, MAC address, and look pretty much similar locations of where the devices actually are that you can now investigate. So it makes the problem and scopes it down to what you can actually go find and what you know about or don't know about in this case. And then you can conduct an inventory and oh, these are the cameras. Okay, now I know these are the cameras and I'm, I'm comfortable with that. So that's, that's a portion of the stuff that's actually there. Now, a, again, um, network architecture for IoT. You can say that you don't want it and say we're not gonna have it. People are still gonna plug it in and that's the problem. And it's kind of the shadow IT and the problematic that exists there. So what you can do is say we're gonna do IoT, but here's how the network is gonna be architected. It will connect to the network or We'll have two zones, one that connects to the network and one that doesn't connect to the network, or one that just goes out to the network and doesn't allow it to talk around the, the corporate uh, network at all. You can do multiple different things around that to specify kind of the, the mix of IoT devices. Maybe it's just talking to the internet and doesn't need to talk, see anything on the other thing. Some of them are just talking to corporate things, doesn't need to go out to the internet at all, uh, or doesn't need the internet to come into it. So you can now take all those different things and break them down into an architecture that is one that you can actually support, uh, the second one that you can actually uh, bring in additional pieces of data and leverage accordingly uh, that's around that. Because having, flexibility in that architecture is critical because you're going to define basically what that device can do both on your network and to the internet and to any other network by that definition. And once you have kind of your four or five basic pieces, you'll be able to define devices to those pieces. So 
setting up that architecture instead of going back from the area and says, we're not going to have IoT to, okay, we're going to have IoT. Here's the categories it's going to play in. And here's the network components that's going to be there. We'll do a lot to give you because now people can come to you instead of plugging it into the wall jack. They'll actually, oh, I need this actually done. Uh, and you can do a lot more details around it. Um, monitor your IoT vendors. Once you know you have IoT, monitor the vendors for software updates, application updates, uh, because a lot of times it's both uh, of that and each one can contain vulnerabilities. Software is written by humans and we all make mistakes, therefore there are always mistakes going to be made. So those are some of the key areas that go into it of how do I, how do I manage that and keep that uh, appropriate. Um, you can ask the right questions. In other words, one of the big ones that I like to ask is about the data. If I'm just throwing my data up to the IoT vendors cloud, do I actually own the data? Is it my data? Can I ask it to be erased? Can you get rid of it? Uh, what are the capabilities are? If I'm storing my data on my own internal thing, well, what do I need? What's being reported? How's it being recorded? And I think that's one of the key areas that gets into a lot of this is around a lot of those key specifics are understanding what questions to ask first uh, before you're into this process because it's a lot harder to clean up a mess once it's already implemented than when I start it from the get-go or, or start it from the very beginning that's there. Um, you can always ask for certifications. There's not any per se uh, that are valid, but you can ask them, hey, do you, have you certified against the OWASP top 10 IoT vulnerabilities? Do you certify against your software build, uh, SDLC lifecycle? Do you certify your supply chain? There's a lot of specific questions that you're there from some of the government entities of IoT devices of like, hey, do you support FIPS 140-1 or dash two? So other certifications that are used for different devices can be leveraged for IoT devices. It's the same. It's just a matter of knowing the questions to ask and looking for the certifications that people are trying to do uh, and at some level, shape, or form that's there. One of the other things that you always want to do is basically understand from your vendor perspective how they manage security issues. Do they post public? Do they send an email to you saying there's a security issue that we've been notified of? Uh, and are they going to address security issues? In other words, hey, this firmware need, has a, a very bad bug. Are they actually going to fix it or are they just going to force me to upgrade? Understanding that upgrade path is kind of critical. What's the life expectancy of my device is there. Now, always come back to the same thing of like you should plan that bad things are going to happen to your IoT. It's not going to work or it's been taken over or it's working against you. Whatever it is, you need to have a plan in place to understand what you would do. And it doesn't mean that you have to do anything, but you just need to actually just think about what is occurring. In other words, if I want to um, know that all my temperature sensors in my building have gone out, what does that do to the air conditioner? Does it turn it on? Does it turn it off? Does the heat come on? Where does it sit? The same with my lighting arresters. If my lighting arresters goes out, does the light stay on or do they all go off? We can't see people, therefore we're not going to turn on. And, and so where do those kind of failovers occur and understand a plan around that? In other words, I have an infected system, uh, a security camera on the my robot net that's attacking someone. How do I disable that camera? because uh, it's on a light pole outside my parking lot. Uh, okay, you need to think about have a response for those functions. Um, and now kind of the other area is you can control what you can control. And then in some cases, you got to live with what you can't control. Are you going to have IoT laws for Fitbits and watches inside your organization? It's an IoT device. It's connecting probably to a corporate asset. Are you going to want to know the data? Do you want to see how many first steps someone took? Are you going to tell people they can't wear their watches in the environment or they can't pair with their corporate entities? 
So you've got to understand what you can do and live with what you can, and then don't allow what you can't. You, but that's an organization decision. That's how many people I have. What's my risk appetite? All those things come into it. And then understand also that knowledge is, is actual power. And the more you understand at a level and have frameworks that are involved, you can now apply a lot of different pressure to something instead of just saying no uh, with that, which gives you a lot of additional capabilities. So is there things that you can focus on, on on the other side of that, looking at that high level? Well, you need to also think about devices themselves because the devices may hold keys that are used to talk to your network, other things. They could be logical or physical. In other words, what's my theft of my device? If I stick it on the wall, does someone come along and unstick it and walk off with it? Uh, what happens to those devices? Do I need to secure it? Do I have to put a figure out a secure mounting program for that or stick it high enough in the ceiling that you need a ladder? Where, where, where do I need to go? But the physical and logical security of that needs to come into it. Again, does it have a reset button on it, a USB configuration dongle? Does it need something that's there, that's connectivity? What, what is it about uh, around that? Uh, most of these report into clouds, so understanding what the data is. Is it security information that's being reported? Is it personal information that's being reported? Where does the data go? Is it aggregated? Is it mashed up? Is it collaborated? Do I pull portions of that data out? Again, understand that. Understand privacy functions with that and do it from the start so it's privacy by design saying we're only using this data for this and this is all we're collecting is much easier than hey we collected everything and now we've got a bunch of extra data that is endangering us because we've mashed it up to different things and different occurrences with that mobile applications typically for setup and configuration or potentially operating on your phone are always functions understanding the network interfaces whether it be wi-fi or 5g or 4g uh, cellular modems uh, other different ways of that communication definitely are important for that the the os and applications are always key of what is actually the iot device running uh, and then what application is it actually supporting so a lot of times they communicate directly over that um, and some of it is secured some of it is unsecured some of it is secured uh, over one network interface but not the next etc um, encryption should always be required uh, it's not an optional thing it should be unfortunately most of the time it is a non-compliance issue in other words they don't encrypt a lot of the data um, Again, getting certificates on those devices, not the easiest thing in the world. Getting a signed certificate for your organization, probably not very easy either. Uh, so it becomes self-signed or I don't have certificates. And so a lot of that becomes problematic in trying to, to establish communications uh, for things. Um, Authentication is one of the keys. It should, and, and I, you can talk about any of the network devices. In other words, this is not really fixed in, in even our networking equipment. So we shouldn't really expect it to be fixed in kind of a new technology area, but it's kind of the same thing of, hey, I have a password. The password is known because it comes up as a default configuration. Uh, and a lot of times they go, oh, uh, we just use the MAC address or we use the, 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 the MAC address last three characters plus uh, this character on the front or the serial number. Any number of things are, are moved around on that. The problem is that, that that's a known MAC address. In other words, hey, you use admin with no password or admin admin or admin password. Uh, we all know those. And so unfortunately, since we all know those, yeah, so do the bad guys. So it's a matter of, well, okay, anybody can take over that divide. Now, having it to be able to be changed is really good. The problem is that a lot of times if there is a default and I can reset my system back to default, guess where the password goes back to? The default. 
So parts of that don't always bode well when I can just reset the thing and get the device that may or may not reset the device uh, or that, or it does reset the device, but the data that's on there is still on there. Um, the physical access security is always key uh, because there is definitely always some of the things that, that fall into it. Uh, in, in, in the security um, realm of that, whether it's be connected to the USB, uh, JTAG uh, instance, which is just a serial connection that's into the side of a reset switch. Um, if I can access them from the outside of the device, that may be something that's actually bad. Um, it's there. And again, USB ports, you can use things like plugs, you can use glue. Uh, in a lot of cases, so I can glue things uh, to a lot of uh, things and get away with that. But if I need it, I can carve out the glue and maybe the connection will still work. Or I can disable things through a reset uh, that's there to say turn this off and it's not on unless I go back and configure it. Um, I think one of the, the questions came in uh, over the chat area of uh, passwords and what is appropriate password use change. Um, passwords, depending on the length, is one of those things that should be changed in a regular format, uh, whether that is, and people have different risk appetites for devices and everything else that are definitely hard to reach and things like that. You may have a longer period of time than devices that are on walls and things along those natures. But do it on a regular interval. So like every, you can do it every month if you want to, that may be overkill. Every quarter, every six months, uh, pick a holiday or right before a holiday, right after a holiday so that there is a routine that's actually done to do that on a regular basis. If you try to schedule it and it's an off every 90 days, well, where does that end up in my calendar kind of things there? So it's like, hey, do it on these four months on the first of the month, you get into some of those, those other areas. So I think changing it is good. Uh, changing it too often is doing that, but you should also always have an emergency change so that if my physical security person left and he left outside the company, all the passwords for all those devices would be changed immediately. So you always have to put in that caveat of when someone that is the user of the technology leaves or that department leaves, you know at that point you need to change the passwords because those are fixed passwords. They're not necessarily connected to any AD, so I can't disable the accounts or any of the other things. So those need to be changed pretty immediately when there is someone that leaves or left or terminates or gets fired, any number of reasons. Whoever's in control of that is now or knew that password is now no longer there. So that's one of the key areas to, to, to look at changing on that side of it that's there. So it's a big, huge thing to try to digest. So where do you start? So one of the easiest ways to start is basically do a class for devices. So there, there's relatively five classes of devices. And it's basically think about if I compromise this device, is there gonna be any impact to myself, to anybody else, to an individual or organization? If the answer is no, in other words, I, 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 I kill the weather sensor on the roof and it gets compromised. Okay, is that gonna impact anybody? Well, maybe someone can get the weather or we're reading the thermometer wrongly or it's converted from Fahrenheit to Celsius or vice versa. Is that gonna impact the organization? Probably not. And there's gonna be little. If you go to the next level, it's kind of like um, limited impact. And the next level is we're gonna have significant impact uh, and we may limit our operations or infrastructure that it's connected to. So there's gonna be some outage, some downtime, some cost that are actually there. 
And then as you continue to step up is now I have sensitive data that's including personal information or yeah, I can have critical infrastructure and personal injury. In other words, my IoT from my doors are, are, are now closing on people and things along that nature. So if I take those kind of classification of devices and I look at the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and fill that out and say, okay, on some of my class zero devices are always gonna be low across the board. Class four devices are always gonna be high across the board. So I should really pay a lot of attention to the class four devices because they're the highest risk that's associated with that versus the class zero device, which is not really gonna affect anything. So I know where to spend my effort. And the same goes for the next classes that are actually there. And th there are some key, key kind of things that you see from integrity. It pretty much is across the board uh, on that. How do I keep that secure? So think about when you're trying to look at devices, how am I gonna keep that device secure? And I'm gonna keep the firmware patched, I'm gonna do all that. The integrity of the device is kind of always going to be there. Confidentiality is really about the data that I'm sending or storing for those devices. And availability is one of the critical areas as well, is that if I'm dealing with business and dealing with people, I need to have it always online. So it being out can cause me problems uh, that are there. So it's that balancing act, but this is kind of a, a, a good focus to try to look in the balancing act and say, here do I need to start? Because I may have 10 of these, which ones are going to be my critical ones? And this is a perfect way to adjust that and, and, and scale it to the risk side of the equation. Best practices, and again, some of this is based upon a lot of documents, and I've got sources in here from EU. Uh, Australia just released theirs. California has one that's coming into law in January. Uh, a lot of others are, are, are based in the UK as well, but pretty much standardized on very similar best practices that are around that. That basically says, hey, no universal passwords. There's no such thing as admin, admin on any of the devices. Your software development lifecycle or SDLC, you're not only resolving vulnerabilities and problems. You're disclosing that you have these problems and that they're being resolved as security issues. And that's that's very important. And not only that you fix them, that you disclose that you have the actual problems that are there. Uh, so that if you, you get a message that says, hey, do you realize your cameras can be watched from the internet? You can turn them off and make some security or risk adjustment accordingly. Um, again, uh, how to report vulnerabilities. If I find a vulnerability, how do I report it to you in your organization or on that device? Uh, sometimes it's a lot easier, especially with multiple manufacturing that's actually there. Uh, and that's, that's a key. Software updates, you're gonna do them the life expectancy has of the product where you state, this product will be supported for two to three years or three years or two years, but there's a date that says we're gonna support this product with software updates that are actually there. You store your security credentials and sensitive data, so it's encrypted. You store it in a, in a format where I just can't pull the device and steal your data and look at the data that's actually there because it's stored in flash memory usually in most cases that are there. And you communicate securely, uh, you expose, your, you minimize your physical attack structure uh, 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 functions because I can attack it via physical, I can attack it from the network side, I can attack it from the configuration side where I'm resetting the switches and doing other capability that are actually there. So all those different areas are the key functions that are around that. Uh, integrity checking, again, my my firmware update is signed, so I'm not just loading something onto there. Um, your, any personal data is protected or anonymized is kind of key. A lot of states will go, hey, we anonymize it. If you look at it, it's not anonymized at all. Uh, telemetry data, understanding what's being sent. Is it being sent in the clear? And if it's being sent in the clear, what is it? 
uh, it's interesting to look at the data and go, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't know that this is sending my account name or this is sending my email address because they're identifying me um, in some of those cases. Um, and then one of the final things is I need to make installation and maintenance easy. If I make it super difficult, no one's going to do it. So if security is an optional feature or you have to understand really technical terms or type a bunch of things to enable it or start things, you know it's not gonna be implemented. It needs to be easy. It needs to be, do you wish to do this secure? Yes, check that checkbox and it's done because no one's not gonna check that checkbox. So that's one of the key attributes that's around there um, to be done. Um, think about IoT as it's not revolutionary because it's based on all this other technology. So it's built, it's built on the human, that's on the hardware, that's on the operating system, that's on the network, that's on the web interface, that's on the mobile network, that's in the cloud, that's on the IoT and it's data. So that's one of the things. We fix the same issues on the network. Hey, we need to encrypt all of our data. I've been doing security so long when the encryption portion was not even considered all this data was flying around and encrypted. Always remember on IoT devices, power is an issue. I, it, I don't have power. I don't have power arbitrarily. I need to get power drawn. I need to pull it into the building. I need to put it up. So power is done the best way power can be done, which is usually with PoE uh, or some other function that's there where it's there. But power is always going to be an issue. So the deployment cost is a cost. So deploying things are always one of the critical areas that I can't get away from deployment. Um, I gotta have to pay the, the, the bucket truck driver to put something on a light pole. I'm gonna have to pay the group of three people to wire a network drop or wire a power outlet. Deployment is a cost. So if someone says, hey, these are only five bucks, Understand that there is $800 on top of that five bucks. And, and, and understand that it's 805 and not just $5 to be able to put it. Uh, and if you're using batteries, that's the key. Because when the battery runs out, the IoT device is dead. So saving battery is often one of the key areas that's there. Use your enterprise technology. We talked about, hey, create a framework. But again, dedicated physical segments. A lot of these are PoE devices, which typically require dedicated switches to begin with. So it makes it easy to go, hey, we don't even have to connect this to the corporate network. We can after the firewall and just let it go out the internet. So you can make a lot of different things with that, uh, using VLANs for network traffic and segmentation. You can always create a tap for your IoT networks and just look at it with sniffers and things like that so that you can see if they're transmitting anything in the clear or something's talking to something that it shouldn't be talking to. Because once it goes out, you're, you, 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 can, you can be rest assured that when it's configured, it should never change unless something's going up. And if it does, okay, what changed? Why is my traffic that used to go to uh, an Amazon instance is now going to some data center that I've never heard of, or, hey, why is this traffic going from uh, Europe all the way to Asia for something? How, how is this occurring? A lot of times you need to look at that ahead of time to be able to do it. If you don't want it on your network, get mobile technology. If I put a 4G card in one of those devices and it, it connects to the cellular infrastructure, it's not on my network has no connectivity to me whatsoever. But just understand that all the data it collects, I have no visibility to it. So sometimes you get what you want to, in some cases that may be part of your risk appetite to go, you know, you're, I don't want you on my network. I don't want to do this. You're just collecting arbitrary information that has no value to me, no nothing to me that's there. Put it on the other network. A lot of times when you're going into, um, office space. I don't own the office space. I lease the office space. So the landlord has the capability of putting IoT devices on your premise, in your premise, just because he's the landlord. And sometimes he can put them on your network or in your lease, it says must provide network connectivity. 
So in some of those cases, hey, can you just put this on a cellular receiver and get it off my network because I don't want it on, it's not my device, I don't want to manage it, I don't want it touching my network. So those are some things that are actually there. Wi-Fi, um, dedicated SSIDs. You could create an IoT SSID or a SID that shows up in people's things and then they'll know, oh, I should connect my IoT device, I'll ask the question. A lot of this is around educating different people around that you're open to IoT and you have ways to get IoT on your network. Risk management is the key. You're always going to have to deal with risk and exceptions. Make smart business decision, not smart business decision, but make it on risk. You can use the classification of the data. And yes, if there's a class four device, hey, maybe we should not do this as a good inkling that's there. We don't really have the controls. We don't have the capabilities. This is our first IoT project. I really shouldn't start with a class four, maybe a class zero, but get, get my capabilities in place and that. You can block, block ports or disable ports, keep people from plugging things in. You can monitor for connection, but you really need to know what's, your, what's yours and what's not yours, because that makes all the difference in the world uh, that's there. Uh, here's some security links that are around that, uh, both the cyber uh, security for consumer Internet of Things, the OWASP security project uh, for top 10 things, as well as Australia's uh, Internet of Things for consumers, which this was released uh, last week um, on that side of it. And it's it's a pretty good function of how to build. Now, it's not a requirement. It's kind of hey, it would be nice if you did this. So always understand that these are kind of requirements. It doesn't always get built into practice. So a lot of it's the same problems. Encryption has always been a problem. Encryption was a problem when the telegraph was invented. So even before our networking equipment, there was encryption issues that were there. Uh, you, you, we faced these same challenges before and answers have been mixed results. Sometimes they work really well, sometimes they don't work at all. But if I build it in front of things, if I know what I'm going into and I'm smart and ask the right question, I can now get my correct answers. I can lower a lot of the cost, um, be careful of low cost, better mousetrap kind of things. Hey, this is perfect, it does everything. Maybe I don't wanna do everything. Because doing everything is a lot of software. Doing everything is a lot of data. And maybe I don't wanna do everything. Maybe I just want one thing. And that may be a portion of that. Um, remember that a lot of IoT Gen 1 stuff was bolt-on. They didn't change anything. It was bad design to begin with, and it's still a bad design. It's just bolted on that I can use it on a network that is actually there. So I look at it, IoT is not a problem. It's a solution. And if you think about it from a human perspective, one person will never be able to do everything. And if I multiply that, add people, I can do more and more pieces of data. IoT devices are that same force multiplied. If I have 10 IoT devices, I can do much more than if I was just one person. So imagine what a thousand people can do and things like that. This is where they're talking about the smart terminology being added to things because it does make a lot of intelligence that I would never be able to receive just as a single human and the amount of people that would be required to provide that data is huge. And so these devices are basically making things much more interactive, making things much more viable for what we're actually trying to do today. And security is just a top layer on that. Uh, the devices are gonna do the data, now making it secure is like we've done with laptops, like we've done with cell phones, like we've done with a lot of other technologies. You can do it, it just takes planning to be put into place, organizations to think about it and wanna do it and not do the, oh, no, no, we don't do this, and, and, and get experience in doing so, and knowing what works in your organization and what doesn't work is the big key factor. 
and what is easy and what is very painful to do. And those are the key areas that you focus in on and you're able to, to, to basically get the IoT challenge uh, into your enterprise as well. So thank you very much for your time. I, I do really appreciate it. Uh, thanks again um, on that side of it. And I don't know if there's any more questions. I'm glad to answer any. So I think my mic is still unmuted. So uh, we do have a question in here as a non-IT person, what are some of the things I should take care of in my organization doesn't have an IoT security policy defined? First, definitely put an IoT security policy and it shouldn't be no IoT. We should, be, we should do IoT but with these uh, constraints. It needs to be on a dedicated network or it needs to be on this wireless SID. Most IoT devices are wireless, so you can kind of focus on the wireless SID. Most of your controllers support up to 32 different SIDs, so asking the IT group to add additional SSID uh, for your wireless controller that says IoT or something along that nature is probably relatively easy. And you need to tell them where you want it to go. In some cases, it may go internal, it may go out to the network, but define a policy, define how the, the connections work, and then work with the product uh, and see, does this mean, is it secure? What's it doing? Is it easy to connect? Did I build it too difficult with too many hurdles or not enough? But you really need to come about that. But you should also have a discussion at the same time of how are you gonna respond? So if this is a, like I said, air conditioning, other types of stuff, it's kind of easy. Does the building shut down or not shut down? But some of the other ones, if your badge access reader stopped working, what does that mean? Okay, we prop the door open, we don't prop the door open, just have some of those constraints around that. All right, so we have a few more questions, and that is, if my device is secure, then how can I keep my connection secure? Yeah, um, so one of the things is, if you start with a secure connection, your connection will, will always maintain itself uh, from that point of it, because it, it negotiates, uh, most everything is using SSL, so it negotiates security at the time of its connection. Um, at that point in time, that's where all the quote, quote, man in the middle attacks occur and things like that are on the connections. I actually have to force you to actually stop talking and start talking back. So if you started with a secure connection and that's the first thing that you actually did, you're in a much better place than, oh, I browse for a lot of different time and then I, I, I set up my VPN, and et cetera, at that point in time. There's plenty of opportunity before then to actually have hijacked you or did something to you so that you don't actually have uh, that's actually there. So that, that's always one of the key things of how do I make that, that, that connection uh, around that uh, is there. If I start secure and the first thing I do when I connect to public Wi-Fi is I bring up my VPN, you're, you're almost 100% better that if I stay there and do a bunch of different stuff and now I, I need to do corporate work, so I bring up my VPN. Right, so the next question is that what steps you know should <clears throat> the employees take who use public Wi-Fi when they are working from home. Yeah, they always use a VPN. Uh, never trust the public Wi-Fi. It's like a Petri dish or a cesspool. Uh, 
because there's no controls. It's, it's like anarchy, Thunderdome, whatever you want to call it. It's like whoever gets it is doing whatever they want to with that. So the easiest way is to use it as a dumb pipe and do a VPN that has a full tunnel. In other words, I pipe all my traffic back to my corporate headquarters in an encrypted tunnel. And therefore, I don't have split tunnel, which says, hey, only corporate data goes there. Or the rest of the data can go out the internet, because now you rely upon that cesspool to provide you internet content. And it's much easier to track all your data back and then go back out uh, on that side of it. Uh, the, the public Wi-Fi is just that. It is completely public, and everybody can see anything, and everybody can manipulate everything that's there. So. It's definitely some of the one of the key areas that's there, and I think that's a that's a key key attribute uh, in a lot of cases. So these are all the questions that we got, and uh, we will also be emailing this recording of the webinar to all our attendees, so please feel free to share it with the colleagues or anyone you know who would be interested. And uh, we also put it on YouTube channel. You can watch it from there as well. And okay. If you still have any questions, please feel free to share those. Uh, and thank you again for the opportunity. I, I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much, Richard, for doing this webinar. It was really informative and really interesting session. Uh, and I personally really enjoyed it as well. Thank you. All right, then. I guess that will conclude our webinar for today. Thank you. Thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. Have a good day. You too.